Aloha, aloha kako. Welcome everybody to uh, the Think Tech show today about marine protected areas and the effort to make our oceans sustainable and protect them from further degradation. We're pleased to welcome today David Spotland. David is the acting superintendent of uh, Papahanao Omokuakea and he's also involved in the effort to uh, establish and bring regulations to the newly established uh, remote Pacific Islands, remote Pacific monument. Monuments. 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 And uh, we're, uh, uh, David was a, an officer in the Coast Guard. He graduated from the Coast Guard Academy and he retired as a captain in the Coast Guard. He was smart enough to go to the William S. Richardson School of Law and be a student of mine. And he also um, is the acting superintendent now for uh, Papahanao Omokuakea. And are you, do you have an official title with regard to the Pacific Remote Monuments as well? No, I'm not officially involved, but we, we've been operating a lot longer than they have, so we're there to provide advice and guidance and help when they need it. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Sherry. I'm very happy to be here. Well, mahalo, Nui Loa, for joining us. And then I'd also like to introduce Heidi Kaiguth. Heidi uh, is uh, graduated from Yale University and uh, grew up in the Virgin Islands. After she graduated from Yale, she even was this after you went that you were in Montana or before? After. After she graduated from Yale, she went to Montana and became interested in the rights of indigenous peoples there. Then she went to the University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law as well, and really excelled there and was noticed by some of the other professors and has uh, participated in international conferences. Uh, Heidi also worked at the Office of Foreign Affairs, and I had the great honor and privilege of working with Heidi when she was there. And now she is the COO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society and just uh, came back from sailing with the Malama Honua voyage. So Heidi, when you were with the voyage, where, where did you sail? I was lucky enough, Sherry, to get on to Hokulea in Tahiti. And then we sailed with Hikiana Lia through French Polynesia, the Society Islands, and then through the Cook Islands to American Samoa. And so how many days were you sailing? We were away for 53 days, and we stopped at 16 different islands. So we sailed a fair distance, and we also spent a lot of time on land. It was a different sort of voyage than the other legs. I see. And uh, we're did, did you get all these warm welcomes that we see posted in the newspaper and on television? Polynesia really is a family. The Pacific really is a family. And, and we were not only warmly welcomed, but the cultural exchange was phenomenal. It was an honor to be a participant in that and a witness to all of the shared values that Polynesians, whether they're voyagers or they're just really attuned to their home islands, much like we are here in Hawaii. So those shared values actually helped us to um, create our future voyaging plans and gave us resilience looking forward to continuing the Mala Mahonua worldwide voyage. Well, David, can you tell us a little bit about the new uh, remote Pacific monuments? And I think that um, some people may not realize that the United States has territories in places such as Samoa, and uh, you know what? What are they? Where? 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 Where have we designated these national monuments? And have the people of these other places in uh, the Marianas and Samoa have they welcomed these designations? Well, there's, there's four monuments, marine national monuments in the Pacific. The first one was Papahanaumokuake in 2006. And then George Bush also established in 2009 the three others, Mariana Trench, Pacific Remote Islands, and the Rose Atoll. Each monument is 
a little bit different in the way it's structured and organized and, and who manages it. Um, they were all chosen because they're um, places of intense natural and cultural resource um, value and the, uh, the question of whether the local populations welcomed the monuments or not, it, it kind of depends on which one you were, you're talking about. Uh, in Papahanaumokuakea, there was a lot of support for it. Uh, most of the opposition came from the commercial fishermen. Uh, part of the monument's proclamation stipulated that commercial fishing would end in the monument by 2011, and it had been a fairly popular spot for commercial fishing. Um, the opposition in uh, Samoa also came from some of the uh, local fishermen. Even though commercial fishing is prohibited, there's still subsistence and sustenance fishing allowed in that monument, as well as the other monuments except for Papahanaumokuakea. Uh, there's also been some opposition in, in CNMI to the monuments. Um, it, in many cases, it's, it's a question of big federal government coming in and, and kind of bulldozing the local populations, at least that's the perception. I, I don't think it's always like that. Um, but the, the end goal is to preserve places that really deserve preservation for a wide number of reasons. So on your voyage, uh, Heidi, did you, uh, did you hear the people of the Pacific uh, expressing concerns about the state of the oceans and the marine environment? the changes that are happening from climate change? Absolutely. I mean, the, these populations of low-lying islands are the first that are getting the impact of climate change or the climate crisis, as the case may be. Um, and so they, they recognize the impact. They recognize that they are not the cause, for the most part, of that impact. But again, these are mostly indigenous cultures who have been very resilient, who have evolved with their place. And so we have a lot to learn from them. They're, they're definitely leaving, leading the way. Uh, not just Papahanaumokuakea here in the Pacific, which was here in Hawaii in the Pacific, which was in a large way, large measure led by Native Hawaiians, the call for that protected area. But in, in Tahiti, when we got there, um, they have a Mala Mahunua proclamation to assure that at least 20% of marine areas are protected by 2020. Um, they've agree to have all of the schools, all of the elementary schools in Tahiti are espousing the values of Mala Mahunua. Um, and small islands throughout French Polynesia, we saw a lot of community-based management where the federal or local agencies had let go of control so that the community, which knows their place best, could best manage for fishing, um, for any kind of sustenance use, because they, they know the cultural and natural implications going forward. The Cook Islands have assured that 80% of their EEZ will be set aside as a marine protected area. American Samoa had a commitment going forward that they will protect under the auspices of Malama Honua the natural and cultural resources to preserve their way of life, the Samoan way of life. And then in Samoa, we also had um, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon come on board and he wrote us a handwritten note put in a bottle um, saying that he would work to meet us in the UN in New York in 2016, uh, bringing on board as many leaders as possible to work towards the betterment of our planet, the sustainability of our oceans, and um, forward movement for all of us as a collective whole and the oceans that connect us all. Well, that sounds very exciting um, and not too far away. Will the voyage be done by 2016? We, no, we should be home in 2017, but we will be along the northeast coast in 2016. with Hokulea in 2016, yes. So, uh, David, uh, has commercial fishing ceased completely in Papahanaumokuakea, and is there any provision made for uh, cultural practice sustainable lifestyle type fishing or is it all fishing uh, terminated? All commercial fishing ended in the monument in 2010. There is an allowance for uh, sustenance fishing and for fishing in association with 
uh, carrying out traditional and cultural Native Hawaiian cultural practices. The monument was one of the first uh, protected places in the country where protection of cultural resources was explicitly laid out in the proclamation. And that's one of the, the primary missions of the monument is to fi facilitate Native Hawaiian access into the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It is a place of intense spiritual and cultural significance to Native Hawaiians. And it still has uh, the highest concentration of Native Hawaiian sacred sites and cultural sites of any other island uh, in the archipelago. So it's one of our jobs is, is not just to facilitate access, but to integrate uh, Native Hawaiian cultural practices in, in all the things we do, whether it's research or education and outreach. So there are, we have tried to uh, be as flexible as possible in, in facilitating all that. So it, it would, do Native Hawaiians have to get a permit in order yes. to uh, conduct any activities, cultural activities or fishing activities? Or they do, but everyone does. The, uh, the presidential proclamation was very clear that all activities in the menu will be permitted except for some certain exceptions. So whether you're going to conduct research or you're going to go up there and shoot a movie, or you're going to go up there and, and conduct Native Hawaiian cultural activities, everyone needs a permit. And the permitting process, it's a joint process with all the all seven of the co-managing agencies. And everyone gets to review all the, all the permit applications, and everybody has to sign off on them before they go forward. And as, do you envision, or do you expect that the new monuments or the ones that ha uh, have not really developed their regulations to the extent that Papaha now Mokoke has, do you anticipate that they will have a similar kind of um, permitting process? And do they also include special provisions for cultural practices? The, all the other monuments have provisions for uh, sustenance fishing, sub subsistence fishing, uh, things like that. The Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, there really aren't any indigenous populations there. So it, right now, there, there's no real need for that in those places. The other, the Marine National Monuments in Samoa and in the Marianas have allowances to conduct um, traditional indigenous practices. Um, one of the reasons why the monument, uh, Papahanaumokuakea has such a I guess a developed, man well developed management regime is that it was on its way to being a sanctuary, a National Marine san Sanctuary, when it was designated in 2006. The other monuments weren't going in that direction. So we were already, we had a lot of the, the management policy and structure already developed, and they've had to start from scratch. So. Well, didn't President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, designate? Uh, Papahanao Mokuakea is a bird sanctuary? Yes, President Roosevelt first designated uh, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands as a uh, bird sanctuary back in 1909 in order to prevent people from coming in and poaching feathers and eggs. And ever since then, it's accumulated other protective designations uh, up, up to and including the World Heritage Site designation in 2010. So it's a uh, it's, there's a number of protective regimes overlaid on top of the monument, or I guess underneath the monument. Um, and they, there's a number of agencies who are involved in carrying out the protections. And it's, it's complicated, but it's the right thing to do because it does bring all the, all the right players to the table. Okay, we're going to take a short break now. And uh, thank you so much, both of you, for the interesting discussion we've had so far. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Alvarez from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate.
Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on, uh, like Jim Alberts. We appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Murray Waki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Well, welcome back. We're here today at Think Tech uh, Hawaii, and we're very honored to have David Swatlin with us, who is the uh, acting superintendent of Papahanao Omokuakea, and also Heidi Kaiguth, who is the chief operating officer of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. So before we took our break, Heidi, you were saying that uh, in Samoa and the Cook Islands, people were very interested in Malama Honua and that they were going to adopt those uh, principles. So what does that mean, that they're going to adopt those principles? I mean, what are the principles? And if they adopt them, uh, does that mean that their, legislator, their legislatures have actually enacted into law? Or what, what does it mean when you say that? Well, Malama Honua, which means to care for our planet Earth or our island Earth, or Honua in Hawaii. Hawaiian mainly means your place. So you want to care for your place because it has um, a relationship with the rest of the planet. And we are symbolizing that with our voyaging and that our canoes are going to be connecting each of these individual places and proving the connectivity of oceans versus as a bridge versus as a separator. And most island nations, they live by the values of caring for each other, respect for place, honoring your ancestors and the teachings of your ancestors, constantly learning and observing and honoring your, your place, your home, and taking care of it as almost an ancestral connection. So, it's not some, it could be that some people will enact legislation in response to this. We're, we're not seeking to do that, however. We're seeking to build relationships. Um, for example, we have a great relationship with NOAA, um, including the Sanctuaries Program, for which David works. And NOAA has been incredibly helpful in enabling us to build other relationships, mm -hmm. say with the United Nations um, UNESCO World Heritage marine world heritage sites in particular. So Papahanaumokuakea is one, the Great Barrier Reef is another. We'll be visiting both this summer. And by linking together all of these different locations of shared values, seeking the next great navigators in each spot, we're hoping more not to teach, not to indoctrinate, but to inspire. And not on our own, but by building these relationships and, and teaching people that their local solutions can inspire global change in a positive direction. So David, maybe you could clarify for our viewers uh, what exactly are the Pacific remote monuments as opposed to the Marianas Trench, which is in CNMI, and uh, Rosa Island, which is in Samoa. So what, what is the Pacific remote national monuments? Where are they? They are four different islands or atolls that are spread out through much of the Central Pacific. They are U.S. territories and have been for various periods of time. Um, one of them, um, Wake Island, is still an active U.S. Air Force runway that uh, is used by various folks, including the Coast Guard, to do search and rescue and law enforcement. Um, Johnston Atoll has a, it is a national wildlife refuge, but it's also a place where they have it has a history of the Army taking chemical weapons there to be dismantled and disposed of. Uh, the other places, uh, Palmyra and uh, Palmyra Island and Helen Baker Atoll, um, have been relatively unpopulated and not used a whole lot. Jarvis Island was a World War II outpost for the U.S. They had uh, several spotting stations. and a matter of fact, a number of folks from, from Hawaii were stationed down there during World War II. So these are very remote places. Um, for that reason, they have very incredible ecosystems that to some degree have been less influenced by, by the 
civilization in terms of stormwater runoff, pollution, overfishing, things like that. Um, so they are really um, incredible places in terms of natural diversity. Well, uh, are Palmyra Island and Johnston Island, are they part of the Hawaiian archipelago? Technically, no, though there is some biological connection with Johnston. The uh, Hawaiian monk seals do make it down there every once in a while. And uh, some of the studies have shown that uh, there's actually um, French frigate shoals, which is in the middle of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, has a more direct biological connection with Johnston than it does with Cure, which is out at the far end of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. But did the Hawaiians consider Palmyra and Johnston Island as part of the Hawaiian kingdom? That I don't know. Do you know the answer to that, Heidi? Some, yes. Yes, they did. Actually, both of them. And there, there's some history of uh, voyaging between the atolls and the archipelago. And they're actually one of the, some of the royalty planted flags in each of those locations. I didn't know that. Well, and now you're, you're cooperating with, uh, <laughs> with the, the activities that are going down there. Now, how about Midway Island? Where is that in Papahanaumokuakea? Midway Island is in the monument. It is, uh, it is owned by the federal government, and as most people know, it was a uh, military base during World War II. It's also, it's now a uh, national wildlife refuge and it's run by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And it does have a, a active runway there that's uh, actually an emergency divert runway for all the Trans-Pacific commercial aircraft that, that fly back and forth between Asia and the U.S. and South America. Uh, it's also home to an incredible population of birds and monk seals and turtles. The albatross come there every, every winter to nest and uh, literally millions of them, including several um, threatened and endangered species. And there's a uh, Fish and Wildlife Service job out there, primarily in addition to um, taking care of the wildlife that is out there, is they spend a lot of time remediating the, the impacts of past human use, trying to get rid of the, some of the stuff that the Navy left in terms of lead paint and bad construction and old buildings and things like that. Well, were there battles there when sunken military warships? There are ships and airplanes um, in the vicinity of Midway. The actual Battle of Midway itself took place um, just outside the monument boundaries, about 60 miles, and I think, northwest of Midway. But uh, there were some aircraft attacks on Midway itself, and there's still um, a number of aircraft. Matter of fact, there's a just two years ago, we found an aircraft that we didn't know about that was in the lagoon at Midway. So there's probably more out there that we haven't found yet. So after 70 years of lying on the floor of the ocean, is it concern that uh, some of these sunken military vessels will leak petroleum or other toxic substances that perhaps military ships or that is always a possibility. Um, the, ch the chances are more likely that most of the toxic stuff has already leaked out from the stuff from World War II. What's more of a problem is um, both at Cure and at Turn Island, there's sites there that the Navy or the Coast Guard used to use that uh, instead of um, carting away the, the garbage and the construction material, which is now the rule, um, a lot of it got buried. And this is, it's not just a problem in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. This has been a problem with, with the military for a long time. When they would leave someplace, they would just leave everything there. So there are, there are some, uh, some things in the sand at Acure and at French Frigate Shoals on Turn Island that we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with right now. So when the, when, um, the Polynesian voyaging society, when it uh, goes to these uh, other islands in the Pacific, uh, is this a, do they find that this is an issue that other Pacific Islanders are trying to deal with, which is, you know, the leftovers from the military presence in the Pacific from World War I and World War II? One of the main issues in French Polynesia is the, the bombing that 
was done by France that went on for until quite recently, actually. Um, we did not actually talk about that. We try to focus more on collective solutions and less on trying to look back at bad examples of taking care of our planet and look, look more towards collective solutions or more localized solutions that other people can build upon. Um, so uh, did you go to other U.S. Did you go to U.S. territories or former U.S. territories besides American Samoa? No, only so far only American Samoa. And then, we, of course, we did visit Papahanaumokuakea when we launched the worldwide voyage uh, back in 2013. We started in Hawaii and we're very pleased to get a permit to go to Papahanaumokuakea. And it's a great place for training apprentice navigators. And we're in the midst of applying for another permit. So a little pitch to, to David that we're <laughs> fabulous and we take good care of where we go. And we are, we are highly supportive of that <laughs> permit and trying to work it through because that's going to be a great event next summer. Yay. It's a collaborative approach. And it's a, a big part of our message is that it's important to take all kinds of knowledge and respect all kinds of knowledge to move forward to, make, uh, to build solutions that are going to be good for everybody. So we have the traditional ecological knowledge and the traditional knowledge and values of voyaging and navigation and observation. And then we have the Western scientific knowledge, which when overlaid together can build incredible knowledge foundations. So we'll be, if we get our permit, we'll be going with Hiki Analia back to Papahanaumokuakea this summer with the searcher. And so we'll be conducting observational and Western scientific experiments and data collections and sharing our knowledge between the two, the two groups so we can both become more respectful and more knowledgeable and working towards preserving our, our home. And both those groups have been up there before, but this is the first time they're going up there together. And we're not just taking, we're also hoping to take some interns and some students and just a wide group of, of folks so that uh, we can kind of get more people turned on to the experience of going up there and, and what can be accomplished when a group of diverse folks works together. So when you say you're going to take some interns and some students, uh, how do the, do the, are they going to sail on the outrigger canoe or will they go on a NOAA ship and how how, it, let's say some of our audience might be interested in applying and participating, how do they go about doing that? Well, the, uh, I would imagine the crew list for those trips this summer are already pretty much set. And really, the, uh, most of the opportunities, because, because birth space is so tight when we go up there, um, most of those folks are already involved in some type of, of academic or research or, or cultural activity. Um, there are opportunities to volunteer on Midway. Most of those are handled through Fish and Wildlife Service. And then there are, are always opportunities to in, intern with the various uh, co-managing agency offices. Unfortunately, uh, I'll be honest, most of those intern opportunities don't involve going to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands just like most of the jobs managing <laughs> or doing work for the place don't involve going there. But that's, that's part of the deal. That's part of respecting the place. But there are opportunities, and, and we also always value the f enthusiastic bright minds who are, who are willing to, to help us do what, what we're trying to do out there. OK, we're going to take a short break again. And uh, again, today we have David Swatlin, Acting Superintendent of Papahanao Omukuakea, and Heidi Kaiguth, COO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Uh, so we'll take a short break. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, President of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society 
to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Welcome back. We're here today with uh, David Swatlin, Acting Superintendent of Papahanao Mokuakea, and Heidi Kaiguth, who is the COO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. And we've been having a very interesting discussion about uh, Malama Honua, uh, which Heidi has explained to us means uh, taking care of the place from which you come. And um, I think we've learned quite a bit already. Uh, Heidi, I wanted to ask you if people are interested in sailing. <laughs> with the Polynesian Voyaging Society and having the opportunity to go to some of these wonderful places that you've been telling us about and participating in the culture that has been uh, built up by the Polynesian Voyaging Society. How do they go about do, doing that and what is it like to, to voyage on a double hull? The shortest answer to the last part of your question is it's magical <laughs> when you get to voyage. Um, and we're a really inclusive organization. We're trying to build sustainability even with our organization and with voyaging here in Hawaii and across the Pacific. So um, if you go to our website, hokulea.com, there's a places where you can support or you can email us and say that you're interested in volunteering. Everybody starts out as a volunteer. I've done a lot of sanding and varnishing in my time and anticipate doing a lot more because we have to take care of our canoes. Um, the training is quite rigorous if you want to become a, a voyaging member for deep sea sails. And it won't end when we return in 2017. So don't anticipate that just because you get started now, you, you won't get to voyage. These canoes, um, Hokulea has been sailing for 40 years and Hikianalia started in 20. 12, we have 25 voyaging canoes across the Pacific now that were spawned by Hokulea, Mama Hoku. And um, we, we're always encouraging people who share our values of being caring and working together and being healthy, both personally and mutually as a family, um, to come and to, to help out, to volunteer and to learn more about us and about voyaging and navigating. and. As you, Hikianali is coming home actually this June. Um, one of Hawaii's canoes is coming home and she'll be sailing throughout the archipelago throughout, from June 2016 through June, 20, June 2015 through June 2016. And so there will be plenty of opportunities for school children to get back on board, for community members to get on board. Um, so, so keep an eye out, check out our website, hokulea.com, and see when we're coming to you and we'll be pleased to greet you. So if school children want to get on board, uh, do they come as a class and mm -hmm. come on board and then go out for a few hours? Is that how it works? Usually we don't take school children sailing. Okay. But we, just for safety concerns. But um, each of the crew members, one of the requirements for the Worldwide Voyage is you have to adopt a school. So we've adopted 96 schools across Hawaii. So we'll have uh, crew members come and speak to the school and you can again contact us through our website to sign up um, to request someone to come and speak about Malama Honua, about voyaging, um, about the worldwide voyage, how to get involved. And then if you want to come on board Hiki Analia when she comes to your island, that's an, you can also contact us through our website and we schedule visits. You can usually fit about 20 to 30 school kids on board at a time, and we'll run them through various activities and teachable moments. So, uh, David, since you're working for the federal government, and it's Papa and uh, it's NOAA that's the lead agency for Papa Hanawa Mokuakea, is that Theoretic fair? Theoretically, all the agencies are equal. All are equal. Yes. So that's Fish and Wildlife, NOAA. And the state of Hawaii. And the state of Hawaii. And then that's two agencies from the part, Department of Land and Natural Resources and then the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And so does everybody get, all seven of them get an equal vote? 
Yes. So the state has four votes and the federal government has the, three? The state has three and then there's two from Fish and Wildlife Service and two I from see. NOAA. Okay. I but we, we manage by consensus, so, uh -huh. um, and that works probably 99% of the time. And, you know, consensus doesn't mean you're, you're absolutely for it. It just means you can live with the result. So, so by consensus, do you mean everybody has to agree? Is that that kind of consensus? Everybody has to agree at least that uh, it's not, it's okay. they can live with it. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. Like I said, they don't have to be jumping up and down enthusiastic about it, but they have to be able to live with it. So is that an unusual model for the federal government? Yes. I think it's an unusual model to bring all these different agencies to one table to manage a single place. Um, and like I said earlier, it is complicated and it's, it's difficult, but it is the right thing to do because it does bring all the stakeholders to the table. And, you know, th if you go through the uh, public comment period like you, you do when you have to establish a sanctuary and like we did prior to the monument, you get the public input and then you keep the public engaged through the advisory council that we have that takes uh, representatives from various constituencies including the public and research and academia. And we, one of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries kind of roles is to facilitate community interaction to help, you know, to better manage the place because we don't have all the answers. There's a lot of people out there with, with good ideas. Well, do you think that in, um, for the Marianas Trench that there'll be a similar kind of joint management between the federal government and there is, the people actually, of CNMI? The proclamation says that the, the monument will be co-managed by Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, but also with the Department of Defense and with the government of CNMI. And there's also going to be an advisory council, As a matter of fact, it's already been established, a citizens advisory council, which has rep also has representatives from government agencies, but it has a number of representatives from the community. And that would be uh, conservation, citizens at large, academia, research, um, and indigenous representatives as well. The advisory council is a model that the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries has been using ever since the program started back in the 70s to, f to facilitate better engagement with the community. So is DOD involved in Papahanao Makuakea as well? No, um, not in the management. And they, uh, as a matter of fact, military activities are one of the exceptions to the permitting requirement. So uh, they are not required to get a permit. However, they, uh, they have been pretty good about respecting the boundaries and try, trying to conduct their exercises outside of the monument. So I, I will say too that uh, the Navy and the Coast Guard have been really cooperative at, at various times in helping us clean up marine debris in the monument and, and hauling it out of there. So that's that's one of the primary threats we have in the monument, so it's, it takes a cooperative effort to get it out. So the no fishing zone, is that 200 miles out all the way to the extent of the EEZ, or is it uh, just the, It's just uh, a 50 miles in Papahanaumokuakea. It's out to the EEZ in three of the four sites in the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. That's as a result of the September 2014 expansion. I see. And um, do other military ships uh, observe the 50-mile prohibition the, from uh, other countries besides the United States? As far as we know, yes, they observe it, but it, they observe it voluntarily because they are their activities are um, an exception of the permitting requirement. But we uh, obviously we don't have uh, eyes on every square mile of the monument at all times, but yeah. we're pretty sure at least the military is, is playing nice. So Heidi, uh, when you uh, visit other places, what, what, what has the, what have you focused, discovered about the main concerns that, that people seem to have? Are they, are they concerned about illegal fishing? Uh, are they concerned about climate change? Uh, are they concerned about uh, 
plastic and other marine debris. What, what seems to be the things that uh, concern people most, our fellow Polynesians and Micronesians? All of those things that you named are top of mind with most islanders. Um, but the thing that has really resonated while we're still in the Pacific, we'll be leaving the Pacific for the very first time this year, was um, the sense of place, that people want to be able to maintain their connections with their home and the relationships of all Polynesians and all Pacific Islanders to each other, to recognize that we are all supportive of each other um, amongst this 10 million miles, square mile region. Um, these little tiny islands are actually a continent unto themselves and a culture unto themselves. And we need to be able to get together, respect each other, learn from each other, and go back to our core values and our core ancestral knowledge um, and use that to teach other people about those very impacts that are hitting us and, and why they should be concerned, even if they don't live on a small island in the middle of the Pacific, um, that they should care that one third of most fish stomachs are now full of plastic, that plastic is in plankton now, because it just breaks down that far, that climate change is going to be displacing a lot of Pacific Islanders, where the next place we go is Australia, and a lot of oceanic people have had to move, have been displaced to Australia, and have lost their homelands forever. Um, all of those things, they're, they're small stories with a big impact that have really resonated in our hearts. Well, Heidi, could you just tell us what a day is like out there in the open ocean, uh, uh, miles away from any <laughs> atoll and uh, deep ocean? What, what is the day like, and how do you sleep at night on a double hull canoe? Where, where does everybody sleep? Well, let's see. Hokulea is her own entity. So I'll, I'll just talk about sleeping on her and life on, on Hokulea. One I love when I can't see any land, when it's just a horizon of blue sea and blue sky. Um, you just, you feel as though you have an opportunity to go anywhere and be anyone, and you're on this platform, this little mini island that's moving, with your crew members who are really your ohana, or your family, and everybody has an important role and an important skill. Somebody's the fisherman, somebody's really good at repairing sails, somebody's really good at uh, cooking, we usually have a medic on board. So everybody has certain specific kuleana, but we all have to be able to sail and to steer. So we go on a watch system. And it varies, but usually you're on watch for about four hours with about three other people. And you're responsible for that canoe. So you really have to love and trust your, your crewmates because if you happen to be asleep at the time that four people are sailing, you want to know that they've got your backs and you're going to be able to sleep through your off-watch session. Because and sleep is valuable. Sleep is very oh. valuable because you're on call at any time. And you, there's never a moment when your body's not moving. So you have to be pretty physically fit, whether you're standing or you're sitting. If you're sitting, you're doing crunches constantly because the canoe's moving. If you're standing, you're constantly readjusting with your hips and your legs and your core. And how about if you're sleeping? What are you doing? If you're sleeping, it's the best sleep on earth. Because but where do you sleep? You're there's sleeping. no room on no, the there's a sleep. hull. There's a hull. There's two hulls. So you sleep head to toe, head to toe. Um, and there's no curtain between you and your, your bunk mate, so everybody needs to practice personal hygiene. And, um, <laughs> but you have the, the waves washing along the shell of the hull next to you, and it just it's a perfect lullaby. And um, when you're out at sea in the middle of the night, and it's a clear sky, and the wind is blowing you just where you want to go, and you can see the Milky Way and all these constellations that are taking you to where you want to go. Um, it's a phenomenal feeling that never goes away. And that ohana that you build on that voyage stays with you for life. Well, I want to thank you, Heidi, for giving us that inspirational description of being out on the ocean. I think we're quite, quite attracted to doing it. And I want to thank both of you for just a wonderful talk today. 
so uh, to our uh, audience, we've been we've uh, been a, had the chance to talk to Heidi Kaikuth, who is the COO of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and David Swatland, who is the acting superintendent of Papahanao Omokuakea. And we'll look forward to hearing more about the Malama Honua voyage and more about the new uh, monuments that have been established in the Pacific. Thank you both very much. You Thank you, was fabulous. You were both just way better than I could possibly have ever <laughs> imagined. Thank you.